Okay, guys, uh, welcome to the second video of our first week of the class. Um, if you haven't watched the video already that discusses the course syllabus, I suggest you pause this video right now and go back and watch the first video that goes over the course syllabus and all of the different ways you'll be graded and so on. Um, this video is called The Past, Present, and Future of the Field. There is a link to a related website that I will share with you that goes with this video. There is a third video for this week, which will follow this one, called um, uh, Introduction to the Dispute Resolution Continuum. So uh, hopefully at this stage you've made your way to our discussion forums and you've taken a look at um, the discussion question, which is think of a conflict that you're familiar with and try to identify the single biggest factor that you think led to it being resolved successfully or uh, blocked its resolution, in other words, contributed to it continuing on. Um, also, once you put up your original uh, reply to that discussion question, you should look at the replies by the other students and offer your comments on their answers as well, because that, as you saw in our last video, was one of the ways that you'll be graded for online participation. So the <coughs> purpose of the lecture today is to give you a better sense of the um, origins of the field, where it began, um, some of the key questions that it has gr uh, grappled with in the past, some of the key questions that it is um, dealing with right now, and some of the future directions of the field. So this is to orient you and kind of ground you and give you a foundation on the whole conflict resolution field. So, um, conflict resolution is multidisciplinary in origins, that is, it has its foundation in psychology, sociology, law, organizational development, anthropology, and political science. Now, I mentioned in my last video that my own background is in political science, uh, I have a BA in political science, and certainly... Sorry, I got a call coming in. And certainly, um, uh, certainly my own training in psychology has been very, very um, helpful for uh, my, my understanding conflict resolution. So um, ADR, um, Alternative Dispute Resolution, is abbreviated as ADR, emerged as an alternative to litigation in the legal field. So in the olden days, um, the idea was that if you had a... Sorry, I'm just going to mute my phone so that doesn't happen again. <coughs> if you had a, uh, a conflict in the past, uh, really, you could either just let it be or you could sue. Uh, you could go the legal route, you could take litigation, uh, you could go through the courts, and the courts were seen as being um, costly. I mean, if any of you have ever hired a lawyer, you'll know they're not cheap. They charge uh, easily two, three hundred dollars an hour. Um, the courts can can take a long time to get through the court system. Uh, all of your grievances, all of your dirty laundry, is uh, you know out there in the public, and it becomes part of the public record, and people can look up legal files. So. ADR emerged, or Alternative Dispute Resolution, emerged primarily as a, an alternative way to resolve those types of conflicts. And the alternative methods were things like mediation. Of course, mediation is uh, voluntary, it's much cheaper, it uh, can be private and off the record and confidential. Uh, if you had a dispute this afternoon, theoretically you could mediate it tomorrow morning, so it's very quick. So ADR was seen as having a lot of advantages over the court system. And <coughs> pardon me. And uh, uh, my next lecture, like I mentioned a bit earlier, is going to look at all of these different ADR techniques. And it's important for you to understand where mediation, where negotiation fits into what we call the spectrum of all of the different um, uh, alternative dispute resolution t tools and techniques. So conflict resolution is really a relatively new field. Its origins began in the mid, only in the mid 1940s, which of course is around the time of, uh, of course, after World War One, and uh, before World War Two, right? Because World War Two is in the in the mid 40s into the late 40s. Um, so 
you know, that's a pretty new field when you consider some other fields like medicine, for example, which easily go back hundreds and hundreds of years. So the very interesting thing, of course, is that, you know, some of the researchers, some of the key pioneers of the field, the key thinkers, uh, such as um, Johann Galtung, for example, um, are still alive. And uh, you'll come across his work, you know, as you, as you delve into this, uh, into this field. And he's alive, and he uh, he's still active. You know, he's an old man, but he tweets and, <laughs> and that kind of thing. So the field um, is very new with its origins in the in the 1940s. There are several phases of evolution in the field, and uh, we'll go through several different uh, phases. So from about 1946 through to 1969, these were the really early efforts of the field, and there's some basic research being undertaken. Um, we saw the rapid growth of the field throughout those years, and then the foundations were laid for further research. Some of the main thinking that came out in those early days was the idea about game theory and zero-sum games. So you're going to hear, or you probably already have heard a lot, this phrase in your life saying, let's get a win-win. Uh, let's find a win-win solution. And really, win-win solution has its basis in game theory. And game theory says that you know, in any given um, situation, any conflict can be looked at as either a zero-sum kind of game or a win-win game. And in a zero-sum game, there's one winner and one loser. So you have a plus one and a minus one, and then the game zeroes out. Um, it's seeing the world very much as a win-lose view. So the court system, in fact, is a zero-sum game. Two people go in front of the judge, the judge says, you know, I rule in your favor, we've got the winner, there's a winner in court and then a loser, right, the person that's been ruled against. The mediation is often framed as a win-win in the sense that, um, you know, <coughs> we can have two people go into mediation with a conflict, but because of the mediation process, they can both, you know, come out with some kind of um, outcome that they're both very happy with through their discussion, so they can create a win-win outcome. Um, so the game theory and zero-sum games began to give some kind of basis to our thinking about conflicts and the type of outcomes that are possible from different conflicts and different ways of resolving conflicts. Um, also during this early stage of the field, they began to look at the relations between potentially contending groups and the idea was that the development of a superordinate goal can bring contending groups into a cooperative relationship. Now, a superordinate goal is, um, it says that if there are two groups that are struggling or, in, con or uh, in conflict with one another, that if we make some goal that's larger than both of them, that both of them want to achieve, but they can only achieve it jointly, then they will overcome their conflict to work together for the super overarching goal that they both uh, want to reach. <coughs> and so there were uh, different examples of that, and it's a neat area to read into about some of these superordinate goals. Um, also during this phase, you've got to remember this is near the, uh, there was the Vietnam War stuff going on in the United States around this period, and so we had the rise of nonviolent action as an alternative, and the idea was that waging a nonviolent struggle can ha enhance the likelihood of later attaining an enduring and mutually acceptable outcome. The idea being that if we try to solve our conflicts through violence, um, uh, we, we eliminate the other person or we damage them or we, we make them mad at us and it's hard to reach a good enduring win-win outcome, whereas nonviolent action can maybe lead to win more win-win outcomes. Um, <coughs> during this phase we saw the growth of peace research in terms of the de-escalation of protracted conflicts. How do we take these conflicts that are uh, ongoing or protracted and really try to de-escalate them? So that's the first phase going from the 40s until the uh, <coughs> late 1960s. Into, and so the next stage that was called uh, the, the origins and the early efforts, the next one could be called expansion. And this starts in 1970 through to 1985, and the field starts to really um, grow exponentially. And there was a consensus on many of the core ideas in the field. So in the previous phase, people were saying, 
you know, we, we're not sure what de-escalation means, we're not sure how to define conflict, you know, we're not sure how to define peace. And then in the second phase of the, um, of the field through the 70s into the mid 80s, um, researchers really started to come together and say we agree on a lot of the kind of uh, key theories and concepts uh, that are part of the field. So um, some of the ideas that came through in this period are that conflicts <coughs> can be reframed so that the parties regard them as a shared problem with a mutually acceptable solution. Um, mediators can learn how to improve their skills so that conflicts can be managed in a way that would also enhance the parties' relationships. Um, small group experimentation focused on the escalation of conflicts and how to interrupt the escalation process. So that's the period through the mid-80s. Mid from 1986 through to the year 2000, um, some of the topics that the field was exploring include addressing the emotional factors in conflict and their resolution. Um, so kind of saying not only let's just solve the problem, let's solve the conflict, let's solve the issues that they're fighting about, but let's also begin to expand it so that you know we can solve this conflict, but we can also address all the emotional content. Now, for me, the risk that occurs with that, and I, I usually mention this when I talk about mediation, is that some people kind of confuse in some ways mediation with therapy. And, you know, is it mediation or is it therapy? And this is kind of saying there was a blending of the two where during your mediation session, you're not only problem solving, but we're also dealing with all of the anger that's associated with the conflict and all of the hatred and all of those emotional baggage. And so then the mediator, um, if they go down that route, and not every mediator is comfortable at doing that or adept at doing that, if they go down that route, then, um, you know, the idea is that we can, we can also repair all of the emotional um, uh, factors as well. So there was also a widened kind of research perspective when looking at, um, looking at conflict resolution. And I said, you know, not only is there the actual mediation session where the parties come together, but we need to understand all of the steps that are before that, what we might call the pre-negotiation stage. You know, how do the parties, um, how are they brought together in the first place? Who invites them to the mediation? Why would they choose to go to mediation as opposed to just, you know, c continuing on their fight? Um, and we also have to understand what happens after the mediation settlement, or what we might call the post-settlement stage. Why are there some <coughs> mediations and some peace agreements where um, they shake hands and they take a picture or whatnot and they sign the peace agreement and then the fighting, you know, starts up the next morning and why do we have other situations where, you know, the peace is long lasting? And so there was a whole bunch of factors that can be um, examined in the post mediation phase that there's a whole set of research around that. So some of those factors include things like you know, did the mediator stick around after the mediation session to help the agreement to get implemented? The, were there sufficient resources to implement the agreement? Were there spoilers around who wanted to um, uh, torpedo the agreement or undermine it or ensure that the war, the violence, or the conflict continued on? So there's a whole ton of factors that you can look at in the post mediation stage to help explain why um, sometimes the mediation agreement lasts and why sometimes it doesn't. And then there was also research into multi-track approaches and that is the idea that um, you know if you ever if you study a war very closely often you'll see that there's not just one mediation process or one dialogue process and there could be official diplomacy happening between different governments there could be unofficial dialogues going on. There could be two different mediators doing different things. And so um, a researcher named uh, Louise uh, Diamond, if I recall correctly, came up with this idea of multi-track approaches, saying that you know there are different tracks of conversations and different tracks of dialogues. And because there's so many, they need to be linked together, and all of these different efforts need to be coordinated. Um, another key idea that came up during this period in the um, late 80s into the year 2000 <coughs> is the idea of ripeness. Ripeness is a widely, widely debated aspect of mediation, and just recently, uh, I would say the field has reached a generally accepted notion of ripeness, 
and the idea is that a conflict is ripe for resolution when there is a mutually hurting stalemate and the prospect that things will get worse. Um, in other words, the idea was how come, um, you know, how, when it, how come some parties will enter a mediation and at other times they won't? And the idea was that if you are offering mediation at the wrong time when the conflict's not ripe, then you're wasting your time, you're wasting your effort. And if the condition is right, if the conflicts are right and it's ripe, then you offer mediation, then the parties will latch on to that. So this is saying both parties, it's mutually hurting, they're in a stalemate. So they are saying doing what we're doing and what we've done in the past is not getting us any further to advancing our goals and we're stuck in a stalemate. There's no more forward momentum in this conflict. There's no way it's going to get resolved on its own. So it's kind of locked up. And both sides are feeling that pain. And we believe that if we stay locked up in this situation, things are just going to get worse. The idea is that if those conditions are present and you offer mediation at that point, the parties will latch on to mediation because it gives them a viable out of that situation, a way out of that situation. So uh, Zar William Zartman is uh, famous for coming up with the idea of ripeness. And so Zartman and Tuval state that a mutually hurting stalemate begins when one side realizes that it is unable to achieve its aims, resolve the problem, or win the conflict by itself. The stalemate is completed when the other side reaches a similar conclusion. So I should say that that's a very controversial concept still this, to this day in ripeness that, um, you know, some people say, well, if a conflict, say, like Syria, for example, it, if it isn't ripe, um, does that relegate the mediator to the sidelines, you know, and all they can do is just kind of sit there and wait and let the killing go on and, um, you know, there's nothing we can do except wait until the parties are in a mutually hurting stalemate. That seems to be kind of like the natural conclusion to that, th to that logic. But then other people say, well, a directive mediator can encourage ripeness. We can create those conditions. We can try to um, force the parties to realize that they're, that they're stuck or they're in a mutually hurting stalemate. Um, mediator or alignment or impartiality is another key idea that came in through this phase. And they say that... Uh, you know, uh, the best, the, the, the principle goes that the best mediators are impartial and neutral. They don't favor um, one party or the other, and only by being completely outside of the situation and impartial and neutral can they be trusted by both sides um, uh, and be most effective. And again, this is an idea that, um, you know, there's, there's still no consensus actually on that particular idea about whether mediators should be impartial. Um, some see it very much as a Western perspective because they argue like, you know, in some African uh, conflicts, um, when the village has a, uh, a conflict, they don't wait for an outside uh, third party mediator, you know, from some other city or some other village or some other state to come there and fix it. But there is, um, you know, uh, someone living in that community, like a village elder who might be a cousin of, you know, some of the parties and that village elder Clearly, they're not impartial because they're they're living in that community, but they can still be an effective mediator. So there's a whole question around, you know, does the mediator need to be this distant, impartial, objective person who's interjected into the scene from outside, or can it be someone from within the conflict or who knows the parties or is related to the parties? Can they still be an effective mediator? <coughs> so I would say that... Uh, Another way to think about this is that, you know, from the year 2000 onwards, um, there are some other new stages. In uh, 2001, when we had the 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York City, might mark the first phase of the 2000s, and I would say the next point is 2009, and I'll tell you why that is in a minute. So if we look at the period from 2001 <coughs> until 2009, um, quite understandably, during that period, especially you know 2001 through to about 2004, there was a lot of focus diverted to the question of terrorism. Um, some other topics, though, that people looked at during that period includes the link between uh, peace, security, and development. Saying, well, how can the work of peace builders um,
contribute to building uh, human security and how can development projects like um, you know building schools and digging wells how does that contribute to peace and we could spend a whole another lecture looking at the linkages between those three things but the um, the kind of the, the the short answer is that if done properly um, peace can indeed peace building work can create security a sense of security and security efforts can contribute towards peace building and of course development efforts like getting two sides that are at war to work jointly together on building a new well that becomes a joint peace building project but also a development project so <coughs> there are indeed uh, linkages uh, between these three different uh, types of activities, peace, security, and development, and they can become mutually reinforcing and support each other. On the other hand, um, the opposite is also true, and you know, security forces can do something in a country like um, maybe shut down a protest or, or um, you know, restrict uh, communications or something, and that can lead to uh, less peace because it's you know fueling the conflict, if you will or feeling the, the, the probability of violence occurring. So um, peace, security, and development um, uh, can go both ways. They can, they can be mutually reinforcing or they can undermine one another. Um, another big factor we looked at during that period was the role of non-state actors. I might say we're still kind of looking at this right now in terms of ISIS being a group who's not an officially recognized state by the rest of the states that uh, exist in the world. However, they are trying to establish an Islamic state. Um, there was also numerous articles on how to improve mediation practice during this period, but no major changes to the fundamental mediation process itself. And we will be, um, if you looked at the course outline, and you looked at the, the syllabus, um, you'll see that we will be spending an entire week looking at mediation. So I will go over <coughs> a basic mediation process so you can understand what happens in a mediation, what are the different stages and phases of a mediation, and what is the role of the mediator uh, throughout the mediation process. So um, also during this period, of course, we had the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, and there was a lot of questions regarding the applicability of taking Western models of peace building and Western models of democracy and basically trying to uh, violently superimpose those on um, countries where that's not the way they've operated in the past. So really that was the premise of Iraq, wasn't it? We're going to take out the dictator Saddam Hussein using force and then we are going to install uh, a Western style democracy um, in the country with, uh, with a government that's friendly to the West and some would argue you know that worked to a certain degree others would argue it was a, a massive kind of failure and what it did was unleash <coughs> the tensions between the Sunni and the Shia in, in Iraq and uh, of course Saddam Hussein um, you know kept a cap on those tensions through his brutal dictatorship and what happened is when we remove that cap, if you will, all of those tensions came to the surface and uh, of course we have now arguably the genesis, the beginning point of ISIS is really out of the Iraq failure um, to install a, uh, a fully functioning western style democracy in that country. So there's been all kinds of debates, you could read articles for the next two months on um, you know the failures of state building um, the failures of exporting Western democracy, you know, what went wrong in Iraq, um, et cetera, et cetera. So also relating from those two <coughs> interventions in those two different countries are a number of pressing questions related to how to deal with the insurgents. And we saw things like, you know, <coughs> President Obama and Bush putting in a, uh, uh, what do they call it, the surge, you know, surging, putting all kinds of new boots on the ground and how to deal with insurgents and how to do um, counterinsurgency operations. And there was a real kind of learning curve about what's the best approach to, you know, go into a village, <coughs> gain the trust of the villagers, and, uh, you know, try to ensure that there's no insurgents living there and operating out of that village. 
Um, we also saw during this period a lot of new efforts in developing early warning methodologies. In other words, um, how do we know when and where a conflict is going to break out in the world? And then a linking early warning to emerging information communication technologies. So of course, um, in 2004, 2005, you know, 2006, smartphones weren't nearly as prevalent as they are now. I don't think there was any Twitter or Facebook that I recall from 2006. Um, but as these new smartphones began to emerge and these new social media um, uh, services started to emerge, people said, well, you know, Twitter can be an important um, tool for people to, uh, you know, tweet about problems like and then raise concerns and they can say, well, I think there's going to be a protest and they're going to break out over here. So um, the, the problem is we had kind of new developments and new technologies and giving warnings that conflicts were going to occur, but I don't think we had much kind of uh, uh, development related to acting on those warnings and giving out, responding quickly which is an important part of, uh, you know, preventing violent conflicts is one, we have to know where they're going to occur and when they're going to occur, but we have to act on that information and actually, you know, take interventions that are going to actually make a, an improvement in the situation. So I would say after the 9-11 terrorist attacks in 2001, <coughs> the next period, 2009, becomes the natural cutting off point for that stage because um, that starts, it marks the start of President Obama's 18 month long surge. He put 30,000 extra troops into Afghanistan and we also saw the use of d drone strikes as a, um, a new tool in 2009 uh, for addressing terrorism. So from 2009 until the present, I think, uh, you know, in 2009 we had the Arab Spring and that was very interesting. A lot of people didn't see that coming, and they didn't predict it, and so in some ways the Arab Spring was really interesting in that it uh, <coughs> it showed the power of uh, nonviolent regime change, like let's take to the streets, let's have massive protests, and let's overthrow governments like in Egypt and whatnot. Um, but we also saw, particularly maybe in terms of Syria, um, the limit of that kind of thing, because Syria, if you look back at the origins of how that Syrian war started, um, we had the Arab Spring starting in other, all of these other Middle Eastern countries where people were saying we're tired of living under dictatorships and we want uh, freedom, we want democracy, we want fundamental human rights. And they uh, over, you know, overthrew, in some cases, the dictators that they were living under. And the Syrian overthrowing using nonviolent change failed. And uh, to this day, it's failed because Assad is still the dictator is still in power. Um, but they went from nonviolent. They said we can't get rid of uh, Assad nonviolently. We can't do a regime change nonviolently. And they, in fact, then went to use violence and lots of violence and lots of ongoing violence. And um, so that's a, a a bad situation right now. So. Um, the Libya intervention by NATO, if you recall that one, which Canada was a active participant, where uh, Libya <coughs> was under the dictatorship of Mo Mohammed uh, Gaddafi, um, was basically um, done under this thing called the Responsibility to Protect Norm, R2P, and that says basically that the people of the world have a... Uh, all of the other countries in the world have the right and the duty to protect citizens living in other countries. And if their own government won't protect them or is abusing them, then the rest of the government, the rest of the world, has a right to step in and do something about it. So NATO was saying that Muhammad uh, Gaddafi was, uh, you know, uh, an oppressive dictator who was, you know, stifling. Uh, people who were speaking out against him and political opponents and stuff like that and that he was a threat to the rest of the world and to democracy and so under this responsibility to protect Norm um, let's launch a huge NATO military intervention to kill Gaddafi and then well how come 
the world did that with Libya in uh, what year was that? I think it was 2010 or 2011. They did that to Libya, but then we had uh, Assad, who was equally problematic in Syria, but how come we didn't have a big NATO uh, intervention to go and, and take out Assad? And arguably now, you know, they say hindsight is 2020, but arguably maybe if we had followed up the Gaddafi mission with, uh, you know, marching onwards into Syria to take out Assad, um, maybe the Syrian war wouldn't be where we're at right now, of course. Um, the escalating Syria conflict actually painfully illustrated the limits of diplomacy and mediation to halt the killing. We saw several mediators, high-level mediators, try to intervene in that conflict in the early days, try to offer mediated solutions, and uh, some of them stepped out, uh, not necessarily embarrassed, but admitting failure and saying, you know, we can't, we can't mediate this thing. Um, does that mean the conflict wasn't ripe? I don't know. So some see some people said, well, force might be the answer to this conflict. Um, but of course, there were complicated political ramifications with using force. In terms of the Russians um, have sided with the Assad regime, and so if the West were to forcefully take out Assad, you would suffer the wrath of the Russians. Um, so all of this began to illustrate the power of the context. Who are the players in the conflict? How do they line up, and what are the uh, different alliances? And some other structural features of that conflict inhibit it from being resolved. So, in other words, it became a perfect storm of all these different factors that came together in order to make the escalation of that conflict the most likely trajectory. Um, and I would argue that maybe only until there's a major shock to the system will that conflict kind of change course. The major shock to the system might be um, for whatever reason, Russia, you know, no longer backing Assad, although I don't see that as being a, a viable possibility. The shock to the system might be, um, you know, if Assad were to be, uh, if he were to be killed or, or die accidentally, or there was to be a coup or new leadership, you know, to take him out as an individual, that might be enough to kind of like, you know, shake up the dynamics and have that conflict kind of go on a different trajectory. If the <coughs> Western world were to uh, put boots on the ground and really start to uh, help out the rebels and push Assad out, um, certainly the trajectory would be very different. So some would indeed say that that Syrian conflict isn't ripe for resolution. Uh, both sides seem to have the, uh, the ability and the desire to carry on this violent conflict, indeed, you know, Russian uh, weapon and military support to uh, Assad means that there's no shortage of resources. On that side of the conflict, there's no shortage of resources for the rebels because they're getting weapons and training and so on from different Western nations. So um, there's just not enough pain on each side yet for them to, to, to say, let's try to solve this thing non-violently, let's try to solve it through mediation. And uh, it seems like the international community can't force it along to ripen it. Now, they've talked about maybe, you know, establishing no-fly zones and that kind of thing, but I don't think that'll be enough to really um, pressure the parties to come into the mediation table. Um, speaking of pressuring the parties, you know, another conflict that's kind of long ongoing and simmering is the Ukraine crisis. And, you know, it raised the whole issue about the effectiveness of putting sanctions on Russia and also the limits of hard power. Um, y you can't just rush into the Ukraine crisis with guns and weapons and boots on the ground without really um, further escalating that conflict or making it a much more dangerous situation. Again, it's very complex and complicated with multiple parties with different alliances. And it seems like um, dialogue isn't going to fix that conflict or the parties aren't ready to enter into dialogue or mediation and hard power such as force um, can't be used and so it seems like that conflict maybe like Syria is just going to keep kind of simmering along for the next little while. Um, in South Sudan, if anyone's interested in that country, um, it's separated from North Sudan through a peace agreement which was kind of uh, uh, groundbreaking in some ways to have a, a, s a new state born through a peace agreement but after that, there was a failure at building up the state and personal rivalries among the uh, leaders and the newly formed government 
fueled violent conflicts, and so that illustrated that um, we can end one conflict through a peace agreement, and we can end that conflict by letting the people have their own country. However, that doesn't necessarily mean instantly that we're going to have peace, because now that new country has its own new internal civil war, if you will. So there was a one civil war in one country split into two countries, and now there's a new civil war in that country. So again, <coughs> a very uh, challenging and, uh, and, and uh, difficult situation to resolve. Um, I think there's a linkage in, during this period seen between conflict and different economic pressures in society and inequ inequalities. And one of the cases that I put into your essay instructions was the Occupy movement in the United States. And uh, some there was a lot of turmoil for, for about a year there. Um, there was, of course, the great 2008 financial crisis where you know we saw the big a lot of bank failures. We saw the car companies in the United States um, almost go bankrupt, and then the government injected a lot of money into them. There were violent protests in many European countries, some of those still ongoing, like in Greek, about austerity measures and stuff you might have heard in the news about the European crisis. But there was a whole period there for about a year where, and we haven't really seen it since, where economic survival issues and uh, loss of jobs and bankruptcy and, and all of that stuff created a whole bunch of new conflicts in these countries. And um, I think one of the greatest examples of that was the Occupy movement in the USA where it was about the 1% against the 99%, right? So that's, if you're interested in that um, topic, I would suggest that you choose that for your essay for your final paper. Um, what about, <coughs> so that covers the period up until uh, 2009 into the present, some of the major developments. Well, what about the future and where we're at right now? Um, I would say that an ongoing concern for a lot of people seems to be the shifting of military and economic power away from the U.S., probably towards China. Of course, um, after, you know, World War II, we had... China, or pardon me, the United States and uh, Russia were the world's two great superpowers, and then when Russia pretty much collapsed, the Soviet Union, the world has only known one superpower, the United States, and there are many people that are arguing we're in a new period now where the United States' uh, global power is diminishing, and so that's shifting the, the world stage, and if they're no longer the most powerful country in the world, uh, who will be the new most powerful country in the world. Some people say it's likely to be China, the rise of China. We see now that uh, Russia uh, certainly flexing its muscles under Putin, and so maybe we will return back to a uh, having two world superpowers with the U.S. and Russia. Um, we've also seen, I would argue, a decrease in military interventions like Afghanistan and Iraq, I think U.S. public support for those under George Bush near the end of his uh, term really started to wane and uh, really through uh, once Obama took charge and people wanted change, I think they got it and we saw some pretty big drawdowns of uh, troops in Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, Obama has refused to really deploy a large number of um, you know boots on the ground back into those countries or into other countries and I know there have been critics of that policy saying you know because he took the US troops out of Iraq they were providing stability they were providing security um, it created a power vacuum and that helped to contribute to the rise of ISIS um, but at the same time while he hasn't deployed um, large numbers of troops to stabilize situations like that. We've seen uh, lots of drone strikes under his watch and um, the rise of uh, special operations to achieve military aims, including, quite notably, the um, elimination, of course, of Osama bin Laden. Um, I would say maybe the possibility of other Arab Springs. <coughs> we saw a whole bunch of countries experience an Arab Spring. Some of them were successful in getting through that, some of them had Western support, some of them, uh, you know, didn't get through it, like Syria, and I don't know if we're necessarily 
past that and there are other kind of Middle Eastern countries that might experience an Arab Spring um, in the future and I don't think we should be surprised if we might see that happen. Um, I think there are new conflicts that are right now emerging related to global warming and the consequent rush to control the Arctic and the resources there. We know that there's gold, oil, diamonds, natural gas, um, all kinds of resources in the Arctic and unfortunately with global warming and the melting of the the ice there, what we're seeing is kind of a new um, a new conflict beginning to emerge in the Arctic. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see more domestic problems in our Western countries linked to um, continue continuing and uh, possibly increasing economic pressures. The global economic collapse of 2008, I mean we're now in 2016, eight years ago um, it seems that the Canadian economy seems to bump along. I just saw an article the other day that says you know Japan was in recession. Um, I would hope that we will come out of that kind of economic pain soon and we won't see any more uh, conflicts related to that but I'm not sure if that's going to happen or not. I think we still need to find some constructive new ways of dealing with uh, aspiring and new nuclear powers, new countries with nuclear powers. Uh, there was a landmark agreement under Obama's watch called the Iran nuclear peace deal and again that's another case I would encourage you to possibly look at in your final paper and so if you look at the instructions for the final paper you will see that that is one of the cases that's listed there and uh, um, there are people that support that deal saying it brought a lot of stability, a lot of security to the Middle East um, in order to have a negotiated agreement with Iran <coughs> over what it could do with its nuclear reactors and um, North Korea at various points over the last couple of years has been um, making threats and uh, arming missiles and testing missiles and yet uh, the West um, hasn't really had a lot of dialogue or negotiation with that country and maybe the Iran peace deal um, might set a model for how can we approach North Korea um, so there's a question there about you know the North Korea situation um, I would say that overall we have to update and improve some peace building tools so I know at this stage in the course you haven't really got introduced to a lot of these peace building tools I've mentioned a few of them like mediation and dialogues um, but a lot of these things you know um, talking through your problems dialogue <coughs> you know it's that's not a new thing necessarily uh, you know people have been doing that since the beginning of time so in some ways um, some of our peace building tools are um, not primitive but not necessarily refined and updated and I also think there's a problem in the field in terms of uh, standardizing our practice so we know like in medicine if someone comes into the ER room we know you know how to triage them we know how to uh, uh, what steps to take and we know how to look for the basic signs of life and all of that kind of thing but when we talk about addressing a conflict we don't have the same protocols or the same rules or the same set of procedures that are standardized so that we can say well with any given conflict let's start with this and then do this and then try that and make sure you don't forget to do this other thing and so that's a big kind of area that the field still needs to struggle with is how to <coughs> professionalize itself, standardize itself and institutionalize those tools into the system. Um, there's a talk here that I will give you the link to. It was uh, actually I was at this conference that was in Washington a couple years ago and there was a gentleman there from the United States Institute of Peace called uh, George Lopez and he was talking about um, what he saw you know as the biggest kind of challenges to the field at this stage and he argued that uh, corruption arms or weapons drugs crime extreme violence and the state system itself are all working against peace right now and you would say that he argues then that we need to equip peace builders with new skills to address these issues and right now and as you continue on in this course in your readings you'll see that you know peace builders um, they don't always have the answers we don't know how to always you know prevent gang violence we don't know how to stop 
all of the school shootings that unfortunately seem to be almost like a weekly occurrence happening in the United States now. Um, you know, we don't know how to stop the rise of global terrorist organizations like ISIS. And so there are big challenges out there still for the field. These are big questions, they're important questions, and it's up to people like you taking this course, um, our future peace builders, um, to come up with new and exciting and effective ways to, um, you know, uh, stop violence and create peace. Okay guys, so that's a recap of, pardon me, that's not a recap, that's an overview of the past, present, and future of the conflict resolution field. I'm going to end this video here, we're just over 45 minutes, and uh, there's one more video to watch for this week where I'm going to talk about all of the different um, ADR tools and techniques called the Dispute Resolution Continuum. So uh, you can go ahead and watch that video right after this one, okay?